Okay, so good morning to everybody. So for this discussion, we will be talking about the different analytical techniques, instrumentation, and automation for clinical chemistry. So for everybody who wants to follow along, you can actually open your book. At chap um, this will be coming from Bishop, Chapter 5. And then the succeeding uh, topics that we're going to discuss will be coming from Chapter 6 and Chapter 7. So we'll be talking about the different analytical techniques, instrumentation, and also automation that is being used in the clinical chemistry section. So always remember that um, in the clinical chemistry section, we're actually measuring different analytes uh, in the laboratory. So whether that is a routine or a special analyte, uh, we need special and we need analytical techniques and instrument for us to be able to identify and for us to be able to measure them properly inside the laboratory. So please do take note that um, the premise of our discussion for today uh, will be covering, the first part will be covering your spectrophotometer, again, uh, spectrophotometer and then auto. Um, atomic absorption, spectrophotometry, fluorometry, chemiluminescence, and even your electrophoresis. So all of these 11 analytical techniques, we're going to discuss them one by one. And hopefully, you'll be able to understand them better um, as we move along to the different topics um, for clinical chemistry. So let's start off with your spectrophotometry. Or, of course, the instrument that we're using in here is your spectrophotometer. So let's move on. Now, so your spectrophotometry is actually a type of absorption spectroscopy. So what do we mean by absorption spectro spectroscopy? So we're actually measuring the light being absorbed by a particular analyte. Okay, so take for example, uh, you have a particular element, a, part a particular biomolecule, be it a carbohydrate, a lipid, or even a protein. So they have a characteristic absorption, okay? They do have um, their characteristic molar absorptivity. So they are capable of absorbing, absorbing light coming from your light source. And when they absorb light, okay, it enables us now, it provides us um, information, okay? Us as medical technologies, medical laboratory scientists, they provide us a means, okay, for us to be able to qualitatively and quantitatively measure this particular analytes in the body. So with the help of absorption spectroscopy, we can now quantify, okay, we can now quantify, and we can now also identify your analytes qualitatively. Uh, when we say qualitatively, we're just um, checking the presence or the absence of a particular analyte. And then when we are talking about quantitative uh, methods, these are now the time when we are um, getting its absolute or relative um, concentration so that we can um, measure the analytes. And when we measure these analytes in our body fluids, we're now able to identify the presence of a particular pathologic disease. Or sometimes, uh, always remember that measuring your analyte doesn't always have to be associated with pathologic diseases. Sometimes, uh, we're also pertaining to your um, physiologic functions. Like take, for example, for pregnant women, we're monitoring the progress of the pregnancy. If you are taking your therapeutic drugs, we're also monitoring the course of your therapy. So um, your spectrophotometry is actually being utilized in a lot of areas. So be it in the diagnosis, monitoring, and even in the management of our patients. But to encapsulate everything, okay, to encapsulate everything that I want you guys to remember when it comes to spectrophotometry, more specifically your absorption spectroscopy. Again, in absorption spectroscopy, we are measuring the light that is absorbed by a particular analyte so that we can qual quantify and we can identify its presence in a particular body fluid. So your body fluid could be your, of course, the most commonly used in the laboratory, Specifically in the clinical chemistry section is your serum. Your, you can also use your plasma, your whole blood, your uh, urine, other uh, body fluids like your uh, CSF, your um, effusions, your acids, and even your amniotic fluid um, in some cases. Okay. So having said that now, before we dig into the principle and the different components of your spectrophotometer, it's rightful for us to talk about the different types of your uh, absorption spectroscopy because there are two, 
Okay? The two absorption spectroscopy are first your photometric measurement and your spectrophotometric measurement. They are seemingly similar. Uh, these two are seemingly one and the same, but the reality is they are um, different from one another. So let's talk about your photometric measurement first. So when you talk about photometric measurement, we are measuring the light intensity without consideration to your wavelength. So take for example, you have your um, I have my phone here. So if I open the if I open my my flashlight, okay, if I open my flashlight, the light intensity is being measured. Okay, so without consideration if it is coming from the ultraviolet region, from the visible region, or even in the infrared region. We're not talking about um, a specific wavelength here. So um, with respect to photometric measurement, what we are only measuring is the light intensity. So a more um to give you a better visuals of how photometric measurement would look like. This is actually um, very much related to your nephilometry and also your turbidimetry, okay? Nephilometry and turbidimetry. So we are measuring, um, we're also measuring light intensity there, but we're not um, we're not specific on to what, specific, uh, what wavelength is involved in that particular uh, measurement. Now, when we talk about spectro, photometric measurement um as you can see the root word photo okay the the word photometric is still here because at the end of the day we're still measuring light but the thing is okay in your photo spectrophotometric measurement when we say spectro okay we're now um we're now dividing the the light into it into the spectrum of light so if you can remember okay the spectrum of light you can see you can now identify there the microwave from the ultraviolet to your visible light and also your infrared light okay so when we're talking about spectro photometric measurement this is now the measurement of light intensity in a narrower wavelength so when we say narrower wavelength um you, we are able not to isolate a specific wavelet of interest okay, that we want to use in a particular um, measurement. So here, what we're, it, it's more like dissecting your light, isn't it? Uh, take, for example, your human body. That, um, take, for example, let's um, let compare your light to the human body. So your human body, ayan, it's just generally the it's generally just your light diba? um unlike your spectro or your spectrum of light we're not trying to dissect your light so we're now identifying the um, ultraviolet region the visible region and also the infrared region so that's very important for you guys to remember so photometric and spectro photometric measurement now um, now that we are able to talk about absorption spectrophotometry and focusing now to your spectrophotometric measurement, maybe one question that you have in mind is that, okay, sir, now um, spectrophotometric measurement means I measure the light intensity coming from a narrower wavelength. But how would you be able to explain its relationship with concentration? Why are you saying that um, when I do my spectrophotometric measurement, I can quali uh, quantitatively and I can even identify or measure my analytes qualitatively or quantitatively. So how come? Okay, that in itself now can be explained by the law, okay, which we call your Beer's law. Oh, we're not talking about your beer, okay? It's too early for your beers for today. Uh, so lesson first. So your beer's law is the law or the principle that governs your spectrophotometry. So beer's law was first discovered by Beers and Lambert. Okay, so these are the scientists who discovered your beer's law who, or rather who explained your beer's law. So your beer's law states um that the concentration of a particular substance, when we talk about concentration of a particular substance, we're talking about now your analytes, your biomolecules, the one that you're trying to measure in the laboratory. So Beer's law states that the concentration okay, of the substance is directly proportional to the amount of optical density. And please take note, optical density is synonymous with absorbance. Okay, so what do you mean by absorbance? This is the ab um, absorbance photo uh, 
absorbance photometry now, spectrophotometry. This is now the, the, the amount of light Okay, that is absorbed by your substance. Okay, and according to Peirce's law, your concentration is directly proportional to the optical density or absorbance. If I may say it in Filipino, ladies and gentlemen, ang ibig nating sabihin, kung gano kadami yung yung substance na nandun sa solution, ganun din kadami yung naabsorb niyang light energy from the light source. Okay, so again. The concentration of your substance is directly proportional to the optical density. Okay, they are directly proportional to the optical density or the absorbance of your um, substance. Contrary, okay. Aside from that, um, your Beer's law also states that aside from your concentration and your um, absorbance or your optical density, another player is your logarithm. logarithm of transmitted light, also known as your transmittance, or in other references, you can read it as your percent transmittance. So what do we mean by that? So your concentration is inversely proportional to the transmitted light. It just makes sense because um, the more light is, that is being absorbed by your substance, the less light that is that will the lesser light is to be transmitted from the system. So for you to be able to understand that better, so let us go to a particular um, a particular um, illustration here. And by the way, I can also um, send you guys a simulation of the Beer's Law so that you'll be able to understand it better. I, um, for, my, uh, for my students, I already uploaded that um, in our TLC. So you will be you in the laboratory part. So you'll you'll be able to somehow manipulate the simulation so that you can see uh, clearly the relationship between your concentration, your absorbance, and also your percent transmittance. Okay. Now moving forward. Okay. This is your um. Take for example. This is your um. This is your um. The red one is your cuvette or your sample set. So the absorbance is the amount of light that is absorbed, obviously, of our substances. So again, as we mentioned, the absorbance is directly proportional to your concentration. The A there stands for absorbance and the C stands for concentration. So they are directly proportional. So before we dig into your transmittance, let me just first explain your molar absorptivity and your path length. Okay, so if you're reading your Bishop chapter 5, now if you're reading your Bishop chapter 5, um, molar absorptivity is defined as the characteristic of your substance, okay, the characteristic uh, of, your absor of your substance to absorb a particular or a specific fraction, okay, a specific fraction of the wavelength. Okay, so what we're trying to say here is that your molar absorptivity vary from one analyte from the other. Just like now, when you go to your laboratory, the wavelength that you will be using in your glucose is different from your cholesterol, different from your creatinine, and even different from your hemoglobin. Because again, um, these substances has diff this substances they all have different molar absorptivity. Okay, and your molar absorptivity in this case, in your Beer's law, it is actually constant. Okay, it is actually constant. So no need to actually um, bother thinking about how are you going to compute your molar absorptivity because this one's constant. On the other hand, we also have your B. What is B? B is your path length. Okay, what do we mean by your path length? Path length now, this is the um, length that your the 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 light needs to travel through your solution, okay? And most of the time, it is dependent on your sample cell or in your cuvette. So this is just simply the distance, okay? So from this point, take for example, I don't know if you can see my cursor right now, but from this point, from one end of the container to the other, that is your path length. So let me take an example. Take for example, I hope you guys can see this one. So the path length here, if I'm going to measure the path length, so the the width, okay, the, the width that the light need to traverse through your sample cell or through your solution, that is your path length. And for most of our cuvette, as you all know, uh, for most of our sample cell, that is also constant. 
Okay? That is also constant. That's why both your molar absorptivity and your path length, um, since they are both constant, we can simply cancel them out. And now, what we're left with us is your absorbance and your concentration. And again, according to Beer's law, your absorbance is directly proportional to your concentration. The more, the higher the concentration of the substance is in your solution, the more light will be absorbed by these substances. So take, for example, you're measuring the glucose of a diabetic patient, and you know that the glucose levels are increased, the more light will also be absorbed in that solution. And let's now um, put into the equation your percent transmittance, okay? Your percent transmittance, as we said, is inversely proportional to your absorbance and also your, to your concentration. Because simple, okay? In, in its simplest form, okay, the more light that is absorbed, okay, the more light that is absorbed by your, by your solution, the lesser light will be transmitted. Okay, the lesser light will be transmitted. Like take for example, let me turn on again my flashlight. If I have my flashlight here, okay, I have my flashlight, and then I block it. Okay, I block it with a translucent um cover of my my notebook. Okay, um, as you can see, okay, hopefully you you can see it on your screen. Although I doubt. Okay, so um, if you guys could see, diba? If you guys could see. Okay, there's still some light that is being transmitted or being um, transmitted through the, take for example, if this is your sample cell, there's still a portion of light that is passing through your sample cell. So that would mean that um, there is only a little amount of light that is being absorbed here. Unlike if you uh, completely have a solution here, as you can see, there is no longer light being transmitted. Why? Because um, ideally, I'm just um, um, I'm just making an illustration for you guys to understand it better, no? So as you can see, um, when all the light is absorbed, there is already zero percent transmittance. Okay, meaning to say, there is no other or no remainder. Uh, there is no light. Okay, that is being transmitted through your solution. Okay, so. Again, um, it is a very important concept about uh, Beer's law and about spectrophotometry that you guys need to remember because at the end of the day, diba? because at the end of the day, uh, when it comes to your spectrophotometer, uh, you're, you will only be able to understand the reason how are, we, how are we able to compute or calculate for the concentration of a particular analyte when you understand the relationship between absorbance and your transmittance. And mind you, okay, later on as we move along, uh, you'll see your photo detector, you'll see some of the components that are actually computing, um, or that are actually computing so that we'll, you'll be able to have your absorbance, okay, your absorbance reading. So I hope I made myself clear with that. So moving on, okay, this, are, this is now, okay, on your screen, if you guys could see, okay, if you guys could see on your screen there, I'll just have to enlarge myself so I could reach that, okay. So here, as you can see, um, on your, on the, if you're facing your screen, this is the left side of your screen, okay, the left side of your screen, these are the different components of your spectrophotometer. This came from, this illustration came from Mac Ferson, the Henry's Clinical um laboratory book okay so you have here your light source okay you have your light source and together you have your monochromator your monochromator which is composed of your entrance slit the monochromator itself and also your exit slit you have your sample cell or your cuvette and then your photo detector and of course your readout device which is commonly now okay uh the most commonly used readout device now are light emitting diode or led display and like before they have an analog dial um that would indicate the absorbance so for us to be able to understand and to rip somehow for some of you, if you have already read about spectrophotometer, this will just be a refresher, a review about your um spec the different components of your spectrophotometer. So the first one, of course, are your light source. So let's talk about your light source first. So light source, obviously, they are the one that provides the energy or the light energy, the radiant energy that um our system will be using. 
Okay? So the light source provide the energy that the sample will modify or attenuate by absorption. So remember that your uh, remember that this light that we are using again depends on a particular analyte. So they vary from one uh, they vary from different analyte. So the usual light that we are using are polychromatic light. So when we say polychromatic light, um, it, it, it include all visible wavelength. So from 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer. So um, that is what we mean by polychromatic light. Okay, when we say polychromatic light, the entire light, ex uh, light spectrum is included. So remember that your visible light, your visible light is from 400 to 700 nanometer. So less than 400 uh, nanometer, that is your ultraviolet light. And greater than 700 nanometer, that is now your infrared light. Okay? So again, your light source is the one that provides um, the incident light for your system. To understand more your light source, there are different types of light source that are being used in the laboratory. Depending on what uh, specific region they are, uh, what specific uh, region in the light spectrum are they providing? Do they provide your um, infrared light, your visible light, your ultraviolet light, or do they provide all of those um, wavelengths? We'll see on the succeeding slides. So the again, okay, again, um, when we talk about your ano, when we talk about your light source, uh, not only do they provide the system the light. From, for your system, they can also be classified into two. We have your continuum light sources and we have your line sources. So between the two, which one is most commonly used? Of course, that would be your continuum light sources. Okay, Your continuum light sources. An example of your continuum light sources now are your incandescent tungsten or your tungsten iodide lamp. So this is the most common light source being used because they do not just provide a, per, a specific uh, wavelength, but they provide a, um, a wide um, or a vast array of wavelength for our laboratory. So they provide visible to near infrared region. Okay, so most of the time we're using uh we're using your tungsten um tungsten lamp or your incandescent tungsten because they provide us the visible region and also the infrared region hopefully guys when i am saying visible region um uh, we're connecting when i say um visible region this is from 400 to 700 and infrared that is greater than 700 nanometer all right now, aside from that, we also have alternatives because in the laboratory, as you all know, we are also are using um, your ultraviolet spectrum. So if you guys could remember, we are using 340 nanometer, 360 nanometer, most especially for um, enzymatic reactions, for some enzymatic reactions. So um, for in that case, we can use your mercury arc lamp, your dute your uh, deuterium lamp, your hydrogen lamp that would provide us a UV spectrum or the um, ultraviolet region of light. You, you can also use your mercury arc lamp again as um, an infrared naman and that would provide us an infrared spectrum or infrared region. You can also use your nurse blower or your glow bar lamp that would also provide you your infrared light or your infrared region okay so it's very important for us to i uh, uh, remember this because again in the laboratory if you're trying to establish your lab you need to know uh, okay you need to um you need to also consider the the light source okay specifically the spectrum okay or the region that they would be providing if you are going to use this types of light sources Okay, so in addition to that, ayan, so in addition to that, your light source again are very crucial in the laboratory because um, your light source, they are the one, of course, obviously that um, in other books, anyways, uh, by the way, your light source is also um, referred to as your exciter lamp. Okay, your exciter lamp. Although I seldomly use the term exciter lamp because um, that is that would be more appropriate for your atomic absorption spectrophotometry, okay, and your fluorometry. So, 
having said that, let's move forward to the next component of your spectrophotometer. So we have your entrance slit, your monochromator, and your exit slit. As early as now, pause. And I want you guys to remember that your entrance slit, okay, that is entrance, entrance slit, your monochromator, and your exit slit, this three, okay, this three affects the degree of wavelength isolation. So what is the purpose of your entrance monochromator and your exit slit? Let's move on to our next slide for you to find out. So your entrance slit, remember, your entrance slit um, is the opening of your monochromator, okay? Um, in some books kasi, in some books, your, your entrance slit, your monochromator, and your um, exit slit, they are as one, okay? They are referred to as what? As your monochromator itself, okay? But in some um, textbook as well, they are being discussed separately, so for the sake of understanding the importance of your monochromator, I'll discuss them separately. Okay? So your entrance slit, okay, your entrance slit minimizes your stray light. Okay? So it prevents the entrance, okay, of any scattered light. So any scattered light, like take for example, um, I only want to isolate the light coming from my light, my my light source. So for me to be able to do that, I need to eliminate other light coming from the environment or coming from the system or coming from any other sources other than my light source. Okay, are we clear? So what you just want to isolate or what you just want to concentrate into is the light coming from your um, specific light source. So you want to eliminate the light or the radiant energy that are coming from other sources in the system. So for you to be able to do that, you need your entrance slit. Okay, your entrance slit is just like a um, an entrance gate, okay, that only a specific um, a specific person or a specific personnel can enter into that gate. Okay? And all other um, um, all other person will not be allowed inside or to pass through that specific gate. So what is um, in our case, in your spectrophotometer, what are we trying to prevent? What are we trying to prevent? Um, that's why we are using your entrance slit. We're preventing the entry of your stray light. So what are stray light? So stray light or any light um, that um, this refers to any light okay, outside the wavelength, that wavelength of your interest. Okay, so um, from your, again, your stray light, okay, your stray light are any um other light that is coming from other sources except from your light source so your stray light needs to be um uh, removed okay your stray light needs to be removed because the uh, presence of stray light in the system can cause absorbance error and if there are absorbance error of course your concentration would be erroneous your measurement will be erroneous your diagnosis will be erroneous your results will be erroneous as well Okay, so you need to prevent any um, stray light from coming into or getting into your spectrophotometric system. Now, um, after your entrance slit, of course, the highlight now of your monochromator is the monochromator itself. So your monochromator is used to isolate an individual wavelength of light. So as you can see, it is um, used to isolate a specific wavelength of light. And it's very important for you guys to remember uh, what specifically does your monochromator do? Okay, so from a polychromatic light, remember your polychromatic light. Uh, take for example, you have a light source that ranges from the ultraviolet up until your infrared region. But you only need um, a particular wavelength around, uh, let's just say, 540 nanometer. Uh, take for example, that's the wavelength being used in cyan methemoglobin. So you only want 540 nanometer. So you only want to isolate that specific wavelength. So what we're going to use is your monochromator. So from a polychromatic light, it would um, dissect the light into the light spectrum. And then it can now isolate an individual wavelength. So the degree, again, of your wavelength isolation is affected by those three factors, your monochromator and the width of your entrance and your exit slit. 
Please do remember that your monochromator can be in the form of your colored glass filters, your prisms. Your prisms is very much common because if you guys could know, if you guys would remember, uh, Newton was also able to identify the light spectrum through a prism. So when the uh, when a polychromatic light passed through your prism, it actually dispersed. Okay, it actually was dissected into the light spectrum that we all know now up to this day. So. That is your prism. So you can use your prism as your monochromator. But in the laboratory, the most specific and actually uh, the most commonly used monochromator are your diffraction gratings. Diffraction gratings have um, diffraction gratings allow us to re to specifically isolate the wavelength of interest because at, as the light band bounces back and forth into your diffraction grating, it is able now to um to isolate. Okay only the light that you want and only the light that you need for your measurement, okay? Only the light that you need for your measurement. Now, okay, having said that, take for example, okay, we're good, sir. Uh, we're able to prevent the stray light from, from, from entering. We're also able to isolate only the wavelength I want for my measurement. Now, what's next? We're now going to your exit slit. So your exit slit now, controls the light beam or the width of your light beam or your band pass. Again, um, the width of your band pass is important. Okay, The width of your band pass is important to be constant because it would affect your molar absorptivity, the one that we discussed in Beer's Law. So for us to be able to make sure that the molar absorptivity is constant, we also need to make sure that the exit slit, the width, of the band pass or the light beam is also constant, okay? So in this case, okay, another thing that your exit slit does is that it allows only now the fraction of the spectrum to reach the sample cuvette. What do you mean by this? It only allows, okay, so take for example, there, there are, um, you were able to i you were able to have your visible region in your inside your monochromator but the only one that would pass through the exit slit is the wavelength of interest the 540 nanometer that like what we're talking about what that we're talking about so that's the only fraction of this spectrum that would pass through the exit slit and reach your sample cuvette okay so again um one good one good consideration when it comes to your exit slit is that the narrower the band pass, okay, the narrower the band pass, the greater resolution we can have, okay, the greater resolution we can have. So, meaning, okay, when the the width or the band pass is lower or narrower, we're able to have higher resolution or higher or rather a greater resolution or a more specific isolation of your um wavelength or of your light, okay? So please do remember that, okay? So um, to encapsulate everything, okay, to encapsulate everything when it comes to your monochromator, again, you have your entrance slit, you have your monochromator, and of course, you also have your exit slit. So again, remember those three because they affect the degree of your wavelength isolation by preventing your stray light, by isolating the specific um, wavelength of the specific wavelength from your polychromatic light and by increasing the resolution by regulating the band pass of your light. Okay? Now, okay, of course, now that we are through with your uh, light source and your monochromator, here comes now your sample cell. Your sample cell, in its simplest um, definition, um, it is the it is the one that holds your solution, okay? If, for example, you want to measure your um, glucose in the serum, this sample cell is the one that would hold your serum together with your reagents, okay? Together with your reagents. So your sample cell is also known as your cuvette or your analytical cell. So you can refer to it as your cuvette, analytical cell, or your sample cell, depending on the reference that you are using. But again, all of those three are just simply synonymous. So sample cell holds the, sum, the solution of which the absorption is to be measured. So remember, one consideration that you guys need to remember about sample cell is the path length. Okay? The path length, again, needs to be constant so that uh, when you measure your, I know, when you measure your absorption, 
Okay, molar absorptivity is constant, even the path length is constant. So path length is actually the distance that your light need to pass through from your solution. If I'm going to get my example again, okay, so here, here's my example. So from this point, going to this point, that would be your path length. So if this is a cuvette, if this is a cuvette that is also its path length, okay? The, the, that is the path length of your um, system. Okay, so in addition to that, okay, in addition to that, um, a quick reminder to everybody, I, um, if you're reading your, your Bishop and your Henry's, please do remember that um, the most commonly used uh, sample cell are your rectangular sample cell. Why rectangular sample cell? Again, I'll go back to path length. Okay, it's easier to standardize the path length when you are using a rectangular, um, when you are using a rectangular um sample cell or cubet rather than using a circular cubet or a cylindrical cubet because it's hard to standardize the diameter compared to standardizing the width or the sides of your rectangular cubet so what i'm trying to say is that always remember that in the laboratory we're usually using your we're usually using a rectangular cubet we're not even fond of using your test tube as the sample cell in the solution because again um i'll say it in tagalog no iba iba yung kapal niya okay the thickness of your um test tube may vary okay there are test tubes that are very thin some are thicker so that would be a problem when it comes to your path length so again to better standardize that what we're using is your rectangular sample cell. Sample cell that holds your solution, sample cell that could also be known as your cubit in your analytical cell. Now, moving forward, we're actually near to the end of our discussion. So after your sample cell, of course, you have your photo detector. Your photo detector in its simplest definition is the one that converts the radiant energy to its equivalent electrical energy that would now be transmitted through your readout device. So remember that your light source gives out a light energy or a radiant energy as it passes through your entrance slit, monochromator, exit slit, and then your sample cell. There is now the light being transmitted or the percent transmittance. Okay, the percent transmittance. The light that is being um the light that is being um transmitted there will now be converted to your electrical energy. Sir, is that possible? Yes, that is possible through your photo detector. So in physics, remember the, the law of conservation of mass and energy. So light energy can be converted to um, heat. Light energy can be converted to other forms of energy. In this case, we can, uh, it is being converted or being transmitted to uh, rather, it is being converted to your electrical energy. So the radiant energy or the the transmitted light okay, that passed through your sample will now be converted to an electrical energy. Okay, Again, it will now be um, converted to your electrical energy. And that electrical energy is the one that will be quantified by your photo detector and will now be delivered by your readout device. Okay, That will now be delivered or be read and be displayed by your readout device. But before we uh, go further, remember that your fo um, your photo detector, I will, I will only be discussing the most common or the most uh, sensitive and specific photo detector being used. But be mindful that there are also other types of uh, photo detector. You can have your photo cell, your photo tube, your photo transistor or photo diode, your photo multiplier tube, and your barrier layers, uh, your barrier layer sem. I just want you guys to remember that among this five, the simplest type of photo detector, again, the simplest type of photo detector are your barrier layer cell. Okay, your barrier cell or your barrier, uh, barrier layer Sem. Again, that is the simplest type of photo detector. But that's not what we're after. We're after the most sensitive and the most specific photo detector. And that would be your what? That would be now your photo multiplier tube or your PMT. Your photo multiplier tube is the most common type of photo detector being used specifically for visible and for ultraviolet light. Be mindful that your photo multiplier tube is also the, the 
um, photodetector of choice for your atomic absorption spectrophotometry and even your fluorometry. Why? Because your photomultiplier tube is very specific and is very sensitive. Why? Because it is able to detect very low light, very low level of light, and quick bursts of light. Quick bursts of light that are related to atomic absorption spectrophotometry, low level of light that could be re um, related to your spectro, even in your fluorometry. So here, diba, a very a minute amount of light can be detected by your photomultiplier tube. So the sensitivity is really excellent. So what do we mean by sensitivity or analytical sensitivity? It is the ability of your method to identify the lowest amount of your analyte. Okay, so the, um, the lowest amount of your analyte. So sometimes um, you're unable to measure the analyte because of its very low concentration. A very good example of this are your enzymes. Remember that your enzymes um, are being measured not by concentration but actually by activity because of their low concentration in our blood. So your photomultiplier tube is a very good uh, photo detector because of its excellent sensitivity and rapid response. Rapid response because it can identify quick bursts of light. Like take for example, it's um, Christmas is near. So the quick bursts of light, so as the light flicker, it can actually measure that very quick burst and very low level of light. Why? Because your photomultiplier, by its name, photomultiplier, what do we mean by photomultiplier tube? It is a capable of amplifying your radiant energy up to 200 times. What do you mean by photomultiplier? The light, the very tiny, the very low level of light and the quick burst of light that was produced or that was transmitted and was detected by your photo detector, your photomultiplier in this case, can now be amplified up to 200 times. Okay, So by its name, photo, the light, is being multiplied or being amplified up to 200 times so that your machine now, okay, your machine, can now identify it. Um, my, my illustration here is not working, but it's actually a GIF. So remember, you have your dynodes there. Okay, you have your dynode. So as your light enter, okay, from, from the left, okay, from the left, as the light enter the first dynode, okay, it will pass through your, it will bounce to your first dynode back and forth. And that is um, as it traverse your photo, your, at it traverse your photomultiplier tube, it is now being amplified or multiplied up until 200, um, up until 200 times it's, original um original concentration or original um level okay so this is very important again because it enable us now to identify and to measure um very low level of light and quick burst of light so that is very important when it comes to spectrophotometry because at the end of the day even if you properly calibrated your monochromator if your photo if your photo detector cannot properly um, detect and transmit or convert your radiant energy to its equivalent electrical energy, there would be errors in your results. Now, finally, after your photo multiplier tube, of course, we have now your readout device. So your readout device, it displays the output of the detection system. So it could be in a form of your galvanometer or your ammeter, the one on your right if you're facing your screen so this is the this is this was the old um spectrophotometer they have um a galvanometer an ammeter that would um um that would point out there that would point out to the specific transmittance or absorbance of your solution but now we actually have your light emitting diode or your led display which enable us to read the absorbance easier and faster all right. So in general, that is actually the different um the different components. Okay, the different components of your spectrophotometer. You have your light source. Okay, let's just try to wrap it up all together before we end. You have your light source. It could be at um the most common we use is your um incandescent tungsten. Okay, your light source that provide the uh, the radiant energy for your system, you have your monochromator, your entrance slit, your monochromator, and your exit slit. The one that you need to, um, to increase the, 
the specificity of wavelength isolation from a polychromatic light to a specific spectrum of light. And then you have your sample cell. Other name for sample cell are, um, together with me, you have your cuvette or your analytical cell. So it holds the solution that will be measured. And aside from that, please do remember that the most commonly used um, type of cuvette in the lab laboratory are your rectangular cuvette for easier standardization of your path length. Second, and then next is your photo detector. The most common photo detector used in the laboratory are your photomultiplier tube because they are excellent. Uh, they, has, they have excellent sensitivity. Aside from that, um, aside from their excellent sensitivity, they can also identify quick bursts of light and very low level of light. And finally, of course, you also have your readout device that would display your reading. So with that, thank you so much for listening. So if you have any questions or clarification, you may send me a message so I would be able to answer them. So these are my references. So thank you so much for, thank you so much for listening. And before I leave, I just want to, I just want to leave, um, a quote from Zig Ziglar, it is your attitude more than your aptitude that will determine your altitude. Again, thank you so much for listening and have a great day.